I'm Coach Mickey. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if this is your first time stopping by, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you did. Uh, and if this is times that you come in on a regular basis, thank you so much. I love having your comments, your questions, and your suggestions. And thank you so much for supporting all of my guests and all the people, whether it's through the podcast or here on the YouTube channel. Uh, you guys are awesome. So uh, today... You guys know I am so thrilled with all my guests, but you have no idea today how excited I have been and waiting up to this date to have this guest because a lot of you know that I'm a huge aviation buff. I do a lot of research. I've had an opportunity to work and meet with the Women Air Force Service pilots. Um, you know how much I like Poncho Barnes, and that is why I am excited about today because after three years of searching, I have finally found someone who who we could come on to our podcast and actually talk about Poncho Barnes. So thank you so much for joining me today. He is a filmmaker. He is a historian. He has got a plethora of information about Poncho Barnes. Thank you for being with us today, Nick Sparks. How are you? I'm great and thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for your interest in, uh, you know, uh, one of the 20th century sort of lesser known characters, but um, really important woman on, um, uh, you know, in aviation history and beyond. I, I agree. And if you are not familiar with Poncho Barnes, you're in for a treat because she is an amazing person. And she was, she was an amazing person. What she did and who she was, I don't think she got enough credit uh, for what she did to help uh, the pilots through World War II. I mean, she was, yes, as the women Air Force Service pilots were very important, Poncho Barnes was kind of a... Uh, she was a trailblazer and she broke a lot of glass ceilings and she really did a lot for our country. And she has, you don't, you don't even hear about her. People don't even know who she is half the time. So I'm going to let you just jump right in and share with everyone who Poncho Barnes is. Sure. Well, let me preface this by saying that if you uh, haven't seen it yet, I made uh, with Amanda Pope, uh, a film called The Legend of Poncho Barnes, which is widely available. You can stream it for free on Amazon Prime. And the film was on PBS for many years. Uh, it won the LA Area Emmy Award, which we're really pleased uh, about. And, um, you know, when you talk about uh, women in 20th century aviation, most people come up with one name, which is, you know, Amelia Earhart, or they might say Sally Ride. Um, but it turns out, you know, in the early 20th century, as as aviation was getting its start, there were, uh, you know, not a huge number, but there were um, a group of probably about 30 or 40 uh, women pilots or the term they used back then was aviatrixes, which I, I love that. I love that word. I never got to use it in Scrabble, but, um, <laughs> you know, these were all gals who tried to make their mark as pilots. Some of them for, you know, more like uh, for publicity reasons. There were a couple of starlets who, you know, got their pilot's license so they could get in the papers. But then there were some people who were, uh, some women who were really serious pilots and and Poncho Barnes was was one of these figures and um you know we can talk about the some of the things she achieved but uh she was the very first uh female stunt pilot in Hollywood and extremely active uh among the stunt pilot community and uh she challenged Amelia Earhart in uh not just um a famous air race, but she broke Amelia Earhart's airspeed record. And, uh, you know, her career was truncated by the Great Depression, but um, uh, she had a big impact. But the, my introduction to to all things Poncho Barnes is from uh, this book right here, which for the, the podcast listeners who can't see it, it's uh, The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe. Um, you know, what happened to me is that in uh, in around uh, 1987, uh, as a high school student, I read this book, uh, which I think a lot of people in my generation did, and was really blown away by it. But there's one section of it that caught my attention, which is, um, it's I'm looking at it now, it's just a couple of pages about, uh, well, it says here, 
this is this book if if you haven't read it or you haven't seen the movie which i encourage you to do this book is all about um edwards air force base and this crucial moment after world war ii when um the space age really started as they say you know the place the future began um and in that era uh there there were there were a lot of you know the best pilots in the world at edwards air force base and there was this um well what tom wolf describes as a rickety wind-blown 1930 style establishment called poncho's fly-in owned by poncho barnes and this was my introduction to um to this incredible lady she after I referenced that she stopped flying because of the Great Depression. But after that happened, she moved up to what became Edwards Air Force Base and opened this uh, bar slash ranch slash motel, which was, uh, you know, known as Poncho's Fly In, but sort of the 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 bad boy and wonderful name that it um, it was also known by was um, the Happy Bottom Riding Club. And anyway, this was a place that all the greatest test pilots in the world congregated. And um, what's interesting about the Tom Wolf book is it describes that that Poncho had a rapport with some of the greatest pilots of um, the fifties, you know, the and 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 the late forties, like people like Chuck Yeager, who broke the sound barrier, obviously, and Bob Hoover, and um, any number of other folks um even scott crossfield and uh you know i remember reading this book in 1987 and kind of scratching my head and saying who is this woman that it says in here she was a test pilot and that she was um uh you know had 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 broken amelia Earhart's speed record how come i've never heard of this woman and and that stuck out in my mind and um, many years later, when I, I was working for an aviation history magazine and the editor, Mike Machat, said, um, I, I am going to have a special edition of our magazine in honor of the anniversary of the release of The Right Stuff. Do you have any ideas for an article? I immediately jumped on this idea. What if I could write an article about uh poncho barnes and find out you know use it as an excuse to find out a lot more about her and um you know mike was not uh very enthusiastic about this because if you've seen the movie or you've uh read the book you know that one of the the things that happened is that poncho's famous happy bottom riding club it burned to the ground in uh, 1953 and it was completely destroyed. And uh, Mike said, you know, Nick, I run a, you know, a magazine where we print a lot of nice glossy photos and make it look interesting. And, you know, there is nothing left of, uh, you know, Poncho's ranch and there's no photographs, everything burned up in that fire. You're not going to find anything. And, um, uh, you know, I took that as a challenge and um, which, um, you know, cause I've learned that if you start looking around, sometimes you can find things that people don't believe actually still exist. And in this case, I got this lead. Uh, there was a, a, a person affiliated with Edwards air force base who said, there's a guy in Pasadena you ought to contact who has some of Poncho Barnes's stuff. And so I uh, found myself about uh, two weeks later standing in the living room of um, uh, a wonderful man named Dr. Lou D'Elia, who uh, he had assembled a, a, a group of about 10 bankers boxes in the room. Uh, and he said that he had recently acquired these and that they, uh, you know, represented um you know, some collections related to Poncho. So, you know, I opened the first box and um, 
you know, my jaw kind of hit the floor because there was a photograph of, of Poncho with uh, General Jimmy Doolittle, you know, the man who led the Doolittle raid on Japan and who was a famous air racer. And, you know, they were like embracing like they were best friends. And then right below that was... Um, a photograph of Poncho with Amelia Earhart. <laughs> and uh, there was uh, Amelia Art, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there was uh, Poncho's um, uh, aviation flying pilot's license that was signed by one of uh, the Wright brothers. And this this box was incredible. All there were photographs of the of the ranch. Some of these things were singed because, uh, according to Dr. Delia, when this fire broke out at uh, Poncho's fly-in, people, we, the place was so beloved and it was such a, a touchstone for the pilots up at, up at Edwards Air Force Base that people ran into the burning building and pulled photographs and things off the walls in hopes of saving them. So anyway, I, I looked at this um, collection of stuff got through um, all 10 boxes and was just delighted because I realized I could, you know, actually write an article about this incredible woman and her ranch and, and, and get it in the magazine. And um, then Dr. Delia said something funny. He said, um, you know, I don't know if you have some more time, but I have a few more boxes that you could look through. And I said, well, okay, well, you know, what do you got? And he took me down the hall and he opened the door and there was a room that was like, it must've had a hundred boxes in it. Gosh. So it turned out he had kind of a forgotten treasure trove of, of stuff related to Poncho. And this was all a collection that had been saved by her uh, fourth husband, Mac McKendry and Mac McKendry had recently passed and, and Lou D'Elia, bless his heart. He had, uh, he and his partner, Mike had, uh, had rescued it and preserved it. And there it was. And when I saw that, I realized we could not only, um, you know, I could not only make an article about Poncho, but maybe I could make a documentary film. And maybe I thought, wow, this is an opportunity to actually meet an excuse to meet some of these incredible people like Chuck Yeager, Bob Hoover, uh, Bob Cardenas, um, and uh, Buzz Aldrin, who, you know, all of them were still alive at that time. And, um, and, and that began this journey that I had into the, the world of Pancho Barnes. She was extraordinary. I mean, besides doing the, uh, helping with with the pilots i know she also started um the union for in the movie industry with the stunt pilots um because they were really risking their lives every time they went out there and, and they she went up a big you know against howard hughes and howard hughes you know was you know a very powerful and and everyone knew you know everyone knew him back then but for her to take on somebody like that in you know, just to be had the safety for everybody she was working with made her, you know, made her extraordinary. And she always seemed to get what she wanted. She was definitely um, a spicy one gal. She, she pretty much held her own weight. Um, but yeah. yeah, so what was it like meeting all these other individuals? I mean, what was there? What did they say about Poncho? Oh, well, let me get to your comment about Howard Hughes, because I think it's really interesting. You know, Pancho was a, a person who came from a very wealthy family. You know, her grandfather, uh, Thaddeus Lowe, was actually something of aviation royalty um, to start with. He had built the uh, Union Balloon Corps during the Civil War, which spied on the Confederacy. And he liked to say he was the most shot at man in the war. Um, he was also a very wealthy man, and uh, Poncho grew up in the lap of luxury. Um, and 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 what's interesting is that Howard Hughes um, was also, you know, uh, born with a silver spoon in his mouth. And when Poncho uh, got into the world of stunt flying, 
it seemed maybe sort of inevitable that the two of them were going to clash. I mean, they they had a lot in common because I think they were not used to um, being told no. And she turned out to be one of the very few people who could stand up to a person like Howard Hughes and just didn't care um, that, uh, you know, he was one of the most powerful men in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, in that era, flying uh, stunts, it was the Wild West. Um, you know, famously, a couple of people died making the blockbuster film Hell's Angels. And that was really just because of the, um, you know, sort of recklessness of Howard Hughes. And there was also people were were being there was kind of a, a rush to the lowest bottom dollar to do certain types of stunts and nothing was standardized. There was no union. And Poncho kind of stepped into that gap and created this motion picture stunt pilots union. And, um, you know, she not only flew stunts, but she, the you know, her big contribution to Hell's Angels was she had a very big, powerful plane. Uh, and she flew all the sound for that movie. Uh, they put a microphone in the sky and she flew, you know, loops and and uh, barrel rolls and everything else around that microphone. Um, anyway, I don't think she and Howard Hughes got along that well, but it's a it's a pretty interesting moment in uh, her life story. You know, it was incredible to um, get to meet some of these uh, really storied pilots. I think. You know, of course, um, Bob Hoover and Chuck Yeager really stand out as people who were not not only respected Poncho Barnes, but they were really personal friends with her. I mean, Chuck Yeager was somebody who she took under her wing um, at his time at Edwards Air Force Base. And she, you know, took trips to Mexico with him. I mean, they were personal uh, friends. And that was really clear in, um, in discussions with him. And I think he really respected her because she had served as a test pilot for Lockheed in the early era, in the uh, late twenties, um, you know, briefly, and it wasn't something she did for a long time, but she understood um, the risks that all these pilots at Edwards Air Force Base were were facing, and I think that was that was pretty unique. I don't think there were many people, um, male or female, that they could have related to from her generation. So it it's it's really interesting, and um, you know, I I loved listening to uh, you know Chuck Yeager just talk about you know his his level of respect for her because. Uh, if you know the man, he really, um, you know, spoke uh, very critically of almost every other pilot. In fact, I I sat in a room with him and listened to him um, talking about Neil Armstrong in very sort of disparaging terms. <laughs> uh, first, you know, well, one of two men to be the first to land on the moon, obviously, and 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 first to walk on the moon. <laughs> But that's uh, General Yeager for you. Uh, I Poncho to me when I uh, was doing the research and and I've seen like I said I've seen your films I've seen your documentary I've seen you know I've, I've researched on my my own and one of the things that stands out about her that really drew me to who she is as a person is she genuinely cared she loved what she did she genuinely cared about these pilots uh she always looked out for their safety she kind of made you know the happy bottom club uh her home I mean, made a home for them because these guys were getting ready to leave for war and she took it upon herself to make sure that they were ready to go and and you know when, when they came back you know the first place they went was to see her so that tells you a lot about a person you know not only because of her expertise and what she could do but also her how genuine she was and cared about each and every one of these guys in every one of these pilots and the gals that actually were there with her too you know for part of that um you know her her farm her ranch well that's absolutely 
you know, you're getting into, she was an incredibly generous person her entire life. I think that that was part of her downfall, actually, especially when we talk about why did she stop flying uh, right around the time of the Great Depression? In part, it was because when the when the Depression hit, like I said, Poncha was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Um, and she, she, you know, famously not only tried to feed all her, uh, you know, fellow test, uh, sorry, uh, stunt pilots who were out of work. I mean, she apparently bought an apartment building to let them stay in uh, to keep them off the streets. I mean, she was extraordinarily generous. Now, it cost her everything because she literally did go bankrupt uh, during the Depression. And what happened is she traded one of her properties, one of her very last properties, she traded for this little paradise that she had spotted up in the Mojave, which is what became uh, the Happy Bottom Riding Club, but at that time was called the, the Rancho Oro Verde. And it was just an alfalfa ranch. And, you know, she built that place up. And again, you know, when she started actually making quite a bit of money, um, you know, running a hotel, she had it, she had a little airport out there that people could fly into. She had a restaurant, she had a dance hall and um, she had a dairy. I mean, she, she was doing pretty well. Again, she was extremely generous. She, um, you mentioned the women's air service pilots. She had a little flying school out there and we interviewed a woman named Babe Story who became a wasp. And that was through um, Poncho's uh, generosity and also scheming because they, they set up a uh, civilian flight program pre-war to try and um, get people uh, in, in the pipeline to eventually be pilots if war broke out. And, uh, you know, Poncho kind of wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, put Babe's uh, credential in so that you couldn't tell that uh, this was a woman who was applying for a license and um, and and got away with it. And so that's how Babe actually got a pilot's license and ended up in the Women's Air Service Pilots. And the same with um, another pretty famous name, Kirk Kerkorian, who eventually built uh, the MGM casinos and um, owned an airline and and had many other incredible accomplishments. He wanted to learn to fly and literally uh, mucked stalls at Poncho's barns uh, in exchange for flying lessons. And that, you know, he was the first to acknowledge that, you know, without Poncho being that generous to him, he probably never would have achieved what he did in life. So, you know, she she did a lot of favors for people and um you know unfortunately uh she didn't really get that back i mean when she got in in desperate times when when that struck when her place was burned to the ground and we can get into what happened with that because it's a it's a pretty famous moment um you know, she really was left high and dry and lost everything for a second time and never really recovered from that, which is a, which is a tra big tragedy in her life. So how did that fire start? Because I'm actually not familiar with I knew there was a fire, but I don't know the background story to it. Well, yeah, it's a it's a really. Um, really complicated story, but, um, you know, the. Air Force started as uh, the uh, U.S. Army Air Force, and it didn't become an independent service until after World War II. And when it did, uh, there was a move to try and, you know, really uphold sort of a very high standard. And there was also a shift from kind of some of the, some of the stuff that... Um, happened right after the war and during the war was kind of by the seat of your pants. There was kind of a, there was an attempt to, to, to make things on a higher level. And, you know, it went from being test pilots who were, who were aces from world war II, like a Chuck Yeager to, to, to people who 
were graduating from college with engineering degrees. And I, I think we can all kind of appreciate that moment. And at that time, right about that time, there came in um, new administration at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, there was a, a fellow named General Holtner who took over. And he had some considerable disdain for Poncho and the fact that she was running a bar uh, and restaurant that was that had that had a little notoriety right next to the Air Force Base. I mean, keep in mind the uh, the place was supposed to be called the Rancho Oro Verde or Poncho's Fly In, but a lot of people referred to it as Poncho's Happy Bottom Riding Club, which was you know a little bit of a naughty name, especially because there were beautiful hostesses who worked there. Uh, Poncho got a lot of out of work actresses and and entertainers from Los Angeles who wanted to come out to the desert and have you know serve some drinks and play the piano and entertain um some really handsome test pilots i mean what gal wouldn't want to do that in that era and um you know so there was kind of a a buzz that uh maybe the happy bottom riding club was actually a brothel um and in light of all this, General Holtner put Poncho's place off limits. And that was devastating to Poncho. I mean, here she was the granddaughter of uh, Thaddeus Lowe, who, like I said, had had kind of established the very first U.S. Air Force with his um, uh, balloons uh, during the Civil War. And and here she was friends with people like General Jimmy Doolittle and uh, Hap Arnold and, uh, you know, Chuck Yeager and Bob Hoover and crew had famously celebrated breaking the sound barrier at uh, Poncho's restaurant. And all of a sudden she was persona non grata. And it, it got uh, much more... Um, uh, frightening when in the midst of all this the air force announced that they wanted to um take her place take her hotel take take the rancho oro verde because they wanted to extend the runway of edwards air force base and said that you know this place is in the way um they offered her very little money for it relative to what she thought it was worth. And so she ended up uh, in a lawsuit against uh, the Air Force, which you can imagine that was not a step that she would want to take, but she felt she had to. It got very ugly very quickly because there were, uh, again, these accusations that she was running a brothel. Well, General Holtner found uh, one person on the base who said that he would testify to that effect. Um, so this became big publicity and it became known as um, the War of the Mojave. And uh, Poncho had a great attitude about it. I mean, she she really saw, um, you know, this fight coming and she, uh, you know, actively campaigned in the press um, she represented herself in the trial and um, did get some legal help eventually. But uh, one of the funniest things she did was uh, she had this logo for the Happy Bottom Riding Club, which is a gal riding on a horse. Um, and she put the initials AF on this logo right between the gal's backside and the saddle. So, you know, the Air Force is a pain in my ass, is what she was saying. <laughs> That's typical poncho. Anyway, in the midst of this lawsuit and uh, this fight over her place, there was a mysterious fire. And um, no one knows, you know, what happened? Who said it? If it was if it was arson, it's just really unclear. But that was the end of the Happy Bottom Riding Club and this whole wonderful era at Edwards Air Force Base, where um, these test pilots had Poncho as a resource. Because uh, once the place burned down, 
uh, it was not going to get rebuilt and uh, Poncho lost almost everything in that fire. And I don't think she got a great insurance settlement. And although she did eventually settle with the Air Force and they bought her property, um, you know, she was never really able to recover from that. I think it was emotionally devastating for her. And that's something we chronicle in the film. So um, again, I encourage you to, to see that. But uh, yeah, that's the story of the fire. And by the way, if you go out to Edwards Air Force Base, which is not easy to do because it is a pretty secure location, but um, you can still see the ruins of the Happy Bottom Riding Club out there. There's actually quite a bit of ruins that remain because they never did extend the runway through her property. Uh, and uh, so you can see like the famous circular swimming pool that she built. And uh, there's a fountain that was shaped uh, in the form of the Air Force logo. So it's it's really interesting to go out there um, because, you know, you can you can feel the ghosts. I mean, that there there was so much fun and excitement that happened in that place. And there was, you know, you can kind of imagine the clinking of the glasses a day that they managed to break the sound barrier. Uh, it was celebrated right there. And at the time, it was it was top secret that that had happened. But of course, Poncho knew all about it. Well, when I was uh, researching and looking, one of the first thing that I ever saw about Poncho Barnes, and you're probably familiar with it, was Poncho Barnes, the the movie that was made with Valerie, Valerie Bertinelli, and right. that. And I don't know, I know how sometimes things get a little changed, you know, when they're writing stories. But when you see that movie, and then you look at some of the things, such as yours with the documentary, yours is a lot more extensive. Yours is a lot has a lot more information. That one just kind of raises over her story, but a lot of it is so true. And and just to know someone of that caliber during that time frame had such a, a pulse on the war and the people in it and the flying and surrounding yourself with these incredible people. And like you said, she really never got the recognition that she really deserved unless you're bringing it up. Because I bring it up all the time. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I've got someone on this here talking about Poncho Barnes. I'm like, who? I'm like, oh my gosh. It's like, he, and then you tell them the story and they're like, I didn't know. I didn't know. And and so uh, for for my guests, you know, for my, my, my circle of friends, all of your information is going to be listed below in the YouTube channel, but also in the podcast will all be embedded. But while we're on that subject, um, Nick, where can they find, you know, your documentary so they can look this up and see it? Right. Well, the, the film is available for streaming for free on uh, Amazon Prime, and you can also get get it on DVD. And I you know, I encourage you to get the DVD simply because it does have a bunch of bonus features, uh, some segments we couldn't include in the movie and um, uh, some some other little segments that we built that were just kind of really interesting. Um, you might not really even be aware of this, but um, for example, Bob Hoover, uh, the wonderful pilot, he loved to use the expression flying balls out, which all that means is the, the throttle in an airplane has a little plastic ball on it. And when you're flying balls out, your throttle is wide open, but you, you can't say balls out on public television. <laughs> and the quote that I love is that supposedly somebody came into the bar uh, during the attempts to break the sound barrier and said to Poncho, you know, Chuck Yeager is going to die. He's he, There's no way he's going to be able to break the sound barrier. He's going to be killed doing this no pilot can break the sound barrier and poncho supposedly grabbed him and said you know chuck yeager could fly up your ass tickle your eyeball and fly out and you'd have no idea what was happening except you'd be farting shock waves and uh, <laughs> we couldn't put that on the pbs version <laughs> either but if you check out the dvd it's on there so um so yeah that's great. Well, I would love to have you back again because there is so much more information that we we can cover about Poncho. Uh, it, it, she was just like I said, she was so extraordinary, and uh, just who she who she was and what she did. Uh, again, is she? Yeah. 
she was like the epitome of women empowerment. She really, uh, you know, don't ever think you can't do something. What she was up against and what she did really was just said, no, this, you know, failure is not an option. You know, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, people are right to embrace Amelia Earhart as a role model. She was an incredible pilot. You know, she's the second person to ever fly across the Atlantic solo after, um, you know, Lindbergh. But, you know, just as much as Amelia Earhart was uh, kind of the good girl of aviation and liked to say that she flew for the fun of it. I mean, Poncho was the bad girl of aviation. She was so much more fun in some ways. You know, she said, you know, uh, you know, if I couldn't fly, um, you know, I would die. I mean, that was how much she, you know, loved it, wanted to do it. And, um, you know, it wasn't just something she did for publicity. It's because she liked to achieve things. So she's a lot of fun. And I would say also, you know, beyond our film, there are a couple of very good books. Um, both of the authors of the books are in the film, but um, there's a couple of, very good nonfiction books about Poncho that are out there that you can find in any library. So I encourage you to find those. Yeah, I was just I was just looking at my bookshelf because I have them up on my book and I meant to grab it before the, the video. And I'm looking and, and one of them I have is um, the Happy Bottom Writing Club. I mean, and that's that's actually one of them that has the information. And then, uh, you know, again, I've got some, you know, the DVDs and I've got, the, you know, the other the you know, the movie. And that was, that was a trick to find. Uh, but you can look up information and, and see who she is and what she was all about. Uh, and I do love the fact that my, that is on my list of things to do. I really want to get out to Edwards and it's only about a two hour drive for me. You know, I just need to, to get up there. I don't even know if you can even get on the base. I'm assuming you can, you can get on Pendleton if you've got a, you know, license and, and your, you know, your registration. So I don't know if, you know, like you said, they're pretty tight in their security. I mean, well, can you yeah. see the, the, you know, they used to have a party every year in honor of Poncho and the kind of golden era of Edwards Air Force Base at the ruins, but they no longer do that. But um, and it is it, that area is off limits. In fact, to go out there and film, we had to, um, you know, have base security monitor us because, you know, they do live weapons tests and everything out there so you don't want to be caught out there um uh, when they're doing something like that but what's happening now at edwards is they are trying to move the history museum they're they're actively moving the history museum off the base and outside the gates and that museum is going to have a quite a big um area devoted to poncho and her legacy and um I think that if you want to get access to the base and see the current museum, all you need to do is contact the museum and get, uh, you know, gate permission. Um, but I can't can't say the specifics of that. No, that's fine. It's something we can they can look up or, you know, even for myself. Well, I have had so much fun with you and I could sit here and we could spend hours talking about this because, like I said, this is my my all time favorite. Like I, I love and I fly. I'm a pilot myself. So, so for me, just to have anything to do, uh, helicopters, um, I have a little bit of fixed wing, but wow. mostly helicopters. Wow. Uh, so <laughs> I, for fun, for fun, not military. Uh, but I, uh, I, I love the history. I, I love what these women did. I love what they, I, and actually you, you taught me something too, because I didn't realize Hap Arnold was out there with Poncho. I know she had a big, you know, that was Jackie Cochran's tie in you know, with women Air Force service pilots, but I didn't know that Poncho had a connection with Hap also. Yeah, they, they were, they were apparently pretty good friends. You know, it makes sense because Hap Arnold was one of the key people that set up what became, uh, what was Muroc, which was the original name of Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, because he was stationed out at March Air Force Base, and he was looking for a place somewhat remote to Los Angeles where um, they could do test bombing and, and training and eventually testing of sophisticated aircraft. I think when he saw the giant lake beds out there, he immediately understood that um, uh, 
uh, this was, you know, an, an engine failure or some other problem, you could immediately land anywhere. And that was something that Poncho understood. That was why she, you know, traded her last assets to buy this uh, little ranch right next to those dry lake beds, because I think she sensed this place is going to be an important place in aviation. And uh, so naturally, they were friends. They encountered each other out there because at, at the time she was out there, there was almost nobody out there and especially nobody who, um, you know, was a former pilot. So <laughs> I think um, she and Hap must have gone on famously. Can you imagine being in the room with those two? Wow. Boy. I know. Well, and I said, now I got my information because I looked at, um, I read the biography from Jackie Cochran, but Jackie was really about herself. <laughs> so I mean, she didn't really share too much information about Amelia and, and Poncho or, you know, other people. She was, it was her biography about what she did and who she was. Uh, but yeah, no, it absolutely makes sense. It means it's the salt beds, if that's the reason you know, Chuck Yeager did break the sound barrier. I mean, you had that that long, flat area, uh, you know, to, to be able to do what you needed to do. Um, yeah, I, I I love it. And there's, like I said, there's just so much, so much history. And I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Just the stories, just the stories themselves. Because like I said, I had an opportunity to meet a lot of the women Air Force Service pilots before they, they passed away. And I've gone out to India and I've done a lot of events with them. And it's not the stories that you see in the book that the people have written about. It's the stories that they tell you when you're sitting around having a cup of coffee, you know, or a drink. And when they get together and start sharing stories, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is not in the history books. Oh, yeah. This is not, no, I, you know, I mean, this is not the information you're hearing. Yeah, that was the, you know, the wonderful thing of like hanging out a little bit with uh, Bob Hoover and Chuck Yeager was some of these stories, you know, for instance, talking about going on an all night bender at Poncho's and then having to get up at six o'clock in the morning and jump in jets to do test flights and just, you know, being on the verge of, of the limits of human endurance because of, um, you know, having a hangover and trying to, you know, fly a high performance jet. I, I love those stories. And um, the two of them were telling us uh, this crazy story about how Bob Hoover, I mean, these guys are just cast out of different iron. He at one point discovered there was a, a flight school in Los Angeles where there was a very attractive uh, female flight instructor. And he signed up for lessons, pretending that he, of course, didn't know how to fly at all and uh you know actually showed up and you know did did some flights with her and then invited chuck yeager to come over when he was supposed to do his solo and of course he gets in the plane and starts doing like the most ridiculous wing overs and you know getting close to the ground and <laughs> And she is just completely freaking out and losing her mind. And then, of course, realizes after about two, three minutes, my God, this guy knows how to fly a plane. <laughs> and, you know, that was just the kind of crazy stuff they would do. And of course, yeah, you would not read that in the official history. But um, they were an incredible duo, uh, Jaeger and Hoover. They were best friends. They were wingmen. They they did a lot of stuff together. So um, that could have been a whole other movie, just the relationship of those two guys. Wow. Well, Nick, I unfortunately, we have run out of time. And like I said, I could sit here and just go through more and more. And I know everybody listens. I have a lot of people that love these stories about history and, and what you've got is a, is a plethora. So I would love for you to come back and, and share some more that you, uh, that you can, they, especially from some of the things we didn't get a chance to cover about Poncho, you know, um, how she, uh, you know, how she got started and, and, you know, again, what she did in her life and uh and a lot of it is just but brought her to where she you know where where we are now uh and then also i'd like to love to hear some more of those stories from some of the other people you met because like you said 
Chuck Yeager just on his own. I would love to hear that could be a podcast on itself because I'm sure you've got some good information there. But once again, I would like to uh, just go ahead. Where can they find your information? Uh, I would love for everybody to reach out and, and experience it and, and understand who Poncho Barnes is. And, and I think what you put together, really, it does it justice. It really does uh, celebrate her life and who she is. Well, I appreciate that very much. And again, yeah, the film is called The Legend of Poncho Barnes. It's on Amazon. And I think we still have a website, legendofponchobarnes.com. So check it out. Awesome. So thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate you. It's so much fun. We, again, you know, I would, uh, I definitely want to have you back because we got so much more to discuss. <laughs> All right. Be my pleasure. Thank you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for being with us today. And again, uh, please reach out and, and see what Nick's movie's about. You really, really will enjoy it. Uh, if it's something you didn't know, it's going to be so much information uh, about history and who she is. And um, and not only that, like I said, for many of you that do watch and, and you you know follow me, you know I'm all about doing, you know, the most courageous thing you can do is be yourself. And Poncho Barnes definitely was the epitome of that. And that's probably why she's one of my favorite people to follow so i will see you again uh look for us we have other guests coming up on our next podcast until then see you